So first I want to thank uh, uh, the organizer, uh, SPE and uh, Geolog for the kind invitation to speak about uh, uh, our project uh, uh, we are involved in this moment. Actually, so as you got uh, probably from the CV, I'm not a geologist. I, in principle, don't work in raw material field or uh, not even uh, oil and gas, okay? Uh, but uh, I work a lot with geologists uh, for the characterization. Actually, what uh, MAUD, the program mentioned before, is actually unique for, uh, is for geologists, is to characterize the texture of uh, uh, geological movement. So you want to characterize deformation of rock, okay? So the texture, evolution, etc. So that's why I deal a lot with uh, geologists, etc. And in the end, uh, uh, we enter in this uh, kind of project in which uh, we are involved. And now we are increasing the number of projects uh, in our uh, lab uh, dealing with uh, raw material, okay? So, so actually, so we just, uh, we see mainly in this one, uh, the big project we have in this moment is a SONSA is a Horizon 2020 project, a four year project started. Uh, we are now, uh, we started the third year of the project. So we have two years to uh, and arrive at the end, okay? So, and so I will talk a little bit uh, what we do also in this project because uh, mainly we develop in Trento uh, methodology instrumentation for mineralogical and chemical analysis, okay? And then we will see also now a little bit of, uh, for us, uh, the future. So this Peridix project, okay? This is uh, in the EIT raw material. Uh, is a EIT raw material project. It is an upscaling project, okay? in which we start from some prototype we had for portable instrumentation, okay? But it's also about this one, but uh, uh, on a different perspective, okay? So let's see, let's start with the uh, SOSA. So SOSA project actually is a project in which uh, we, we go from uh, sonic drilling, okay? Because here it's not like in the case of oil and gas, uh, we need to get uh, core drilling. So we need the core intact uh, as much as possible. So sonic drilling is a good way to get uh, a, a core uh, uh, well-defined, sm sufficiently smooth, let's say, if uh, the core is uh, actually, uh, let's say, sufficiently hard and uh, resistant. We will see in several cases it is not. Uh, and then uh, the other part uh, we will see are then uh, uh, a core scanner and uh, we want to characterize uh, this core to get uh, the amount uh, well of uh, uh, metal we have in actually. So uh, the, let's say the uh, transition metal uh, we have in if uh, we have a good percentage uh, to be use it uh, by the processing uh, after the mining, okay? Uh, so actually we have involved uh, one large enterprise. So this is Eramet. Actually Eramet has a base in France, but all the mines are out of Europe actually, okay? Because uh, they are mainly involved in uh, uh, manganese, nickel, cobalt field, okay? Then there are two SMEs. Uh, Okay, so uh, Royal Asia Camp, uh, this is uh, from uh, Netherlands, and Inel TFS. Actually, uh, this one is a little bit, uh, so it was uh, a SMEs when it entered, but now it's part of Thermo Fisher, so uh, you can consider it a little bit large. Okay, then there is BRGM. BRGM is the, is, uh, the survey uh, geological Survey uh, Office of France, okay? 
and then uh, five academics. So one is in Con, okay, this is the Christmas, uh, Trento, we are in, then there is Verona, they are specialized in Raman, and Vilnius, Vilnius University, where we have all the database, crystallography database, uh, etc., online part in the project, and then the Technical University of Delft. Well, this is considered quite a large uh, project for Horizon 2020, okay? They said it is probably uh, one of the largest, one of the few large projects in the raw material field. Okay, so what is the goal of SOLSA? So actually, the problem is the ore from where you want to extract, for example, the nickel. Well, in the project, we. Aramet wanted the nickel. Now they started to add, okay, because the, they see it's working well, uh, so they want to see also magnesium and uh, cobalt. Magnesium actually make a big change in, in our goal. So uh, the problem is uh, the mineral they have uh, is quite heterogeneous, okay? So you have uh, the nickel is not distributed everywhere and the mineral they want to extract is actually uh, on the boundary of uh, big grain, etc. So you want to characterize the heterogeneous boundary. There is an heterogeneous grade also along the core. So, and actually they want to see up to where they can arrive uh, and the nickel is changing through the uh, depth, okay? In depth. So, and actually it's going low grade, going down. Okay, so you have to arrive up to the minimum uh, that uh, is minimum for the extraction and processing. So there is a, actually quite a, a structural complexity in this uh, geological part. Uh, so we need, uh, so the goal is uh, actually to, uh, we need to target all of them, okay? Because uh, if uh, we can solve uh, at least part of the problem, then we can have a big impact on economic profitability for mining operation, and so getting resource efficiently, reducing energy consumption, okay? So we decrease environmental impact, uh, waste production also we can minimize. So, and this is done actually through uh, the uh, Uh, the salsa that is targeting actually the uh, RTM. Okay, now, so what are the problem? Okay, so you get this uh, core. So first, uh, this target mainly the exploration. It's not the true exploration done before to discover new mining, etc. But is on the mine to uh, check uh, in the mind where are the part uh, and how deep uh, they can go to extract, okay? So what is important is uh, actually that you have a, a fast decision uh, loop, uh, not a slow one. And so normally, so you want to do the drilling, process everything, okay? Uh, so this is done through sampling normally. So you take samples, okay? And then you have to send to the labs, okay, for the analysis. Normally, so there is a first sam sampling done, uh, for example, for, with portable XRF uh, system, just to check there is nickel not, uh, okay. And then they cut, uh, because then you want to characterize there is 1% of nickel, 0 0.5 or 2%. So, because uh, if it is 0 0.5, probably it's too low. If it is one, it's okay, so they want to know in step of 0.1%, okay, how much nickel there is. So to decide. So they have to send back to the laboratory in Europe, okay, and then uh, there goes through different laboratory, get the analysis and come back, okay, uh, one or several months later, okay. So how you can do fast decision, okay, there. So you simply do all the drilling, okay? And then you wait uh, to see the result later, okay? And you maybe drill also too much or uh, 
whatever. Okay, so actually what we want to do is to, everyone want to do is to get the result on site and on time, okay? So if you can get uh, that one, then you can uh, get a faster decision, okay? Where to continue drilling, mining, etc. so, or to stop, uh, okay? And this actually increase uh, all the value. Okay, so this is actually a big problem for cost, okay? Because just the analysis has a big impact uh, then not only, but in all uh, the cost, uh, especially through the delay of month uh, to get the result back. So normally, okay, while different technique, uh, normally the analysis is always nearly constant as a cost, uh, actually the drilling, uh, part uh, may change uh, depending on how you do the drilling sampling, okay? So, and the cost normally depend on drilling sampling. Uh, this is uh, because you want to do a geological mapping, geophysical exploration, so they want to characterize large area, you no know, in deep uh, water is, it's a little bit similar what you want to do with oil and gas. It's only here they want to map, uh, okay, the mineral component for the nickel, okay? So actually the drilling cost uh, actually depends, well, what kind of technique, core diameter, how much uh, the amount of in meter of drilling per year, okay? And the distance uh, from the infrastructure. This actually, uh, so if you want to do a, what they see, there is a, really direct correlation uh, from the drilling distance to infrastructure, and you can approximate something like uh, 100, 400 euro per meter, okay? That uh, when it become large, uh, start to be quite high, okay? That is why you want to process on the field, okay? Everything. But the problem is, uh, you want a good characterization. So you need really to characterize both the mineralogical part and the chemical, okay? It's not only the amount of nickel, because actually for the processing later, uh, extracting the nickel depends also where it is in the nickel, what uh, mineralogical uh, phases uh, are containing the nickel, because some are more hard to reduce, uh, other are uh, maybe uh, more easy, okay? So, so the real-time mining, okay? So what you want to do a from a discontinuous process, so the one in which you drill, then you send, get back the result, and decide, okay, this area, we do whatever. You want to do a continuous process in which you drill, and as soon as you find that there, there is no more nickel, you can stop, okay? and you can proceed uh, much faster and uh, with less cost, okay? So what you do is exploration mining here, the cycle with the SOLSA expert system, as we call uh, this system, we want to cut back uh, and get a feedback uh, so we can do it uh, much faster, okay? Instead of uh, going through everything. So closing the gap between exploration and mining. So the exploration and mining uh, working more close together, okay? Not to completely separate step. Okay, so what we need uh, actually is a real-time systematic mineralogical and chemical analysis. That is, uh, we want to know how the amount of metal and what uh, phases uh, contain, what mineral contain the metal, okay? During the drilling. So, and this is really during, they want to go down with the drilling and get uh, this one. So, so what there are the different parts inside the source, uh, okay? So you can think about three parts uh, in which you have the drilling part, uh, okay? And then there is the analysis part, uh, okay? So the scanner plus uh, whatever the analysis. And actually there is the part uh, with the so software in which we have uh, also the software to analyze the data, but also to do all the um, 
machine learning process to map uh, the area and also use uh, uh, previous data, etc., to get a more in deep uh, geological knowledge uh, of the area, okay, and similar area, just to improve the process, okay. So, ah, uh, well, sorry. So actually, solid drilling was one part. Then uh, there is a core scanner, okay, take uh, the core and analyze to uh, get uh, what are the region of interest, okay. So where are the parts that we need uh, more in deep analysis, okay? So then uh, this one go into quantitative on-site chemical mineralogical analysis. Actually, this was not the first, uh, when we submit the proje project, this one was just one. So we thought that the core scanner was uh, doing everything at once. And then uh, after it took one year, to deal with the people in New Caledonia, okay, to get, uh, oh no, we, we need uh, to go 60 meters per day. So, and scan every centimeter. So say, okay, 60 meters per day, scanning every centimeter with one machine we cannot do with the precision you want. So we had to change strategy. So actually we divide in two, so there is one scanner just to locate what are the region of interest, okay? And then uh, on the region of interest, then we do a more close mapping, okay? To, for the heterogeneity and to get uh, the precise amount of nickel and mineralogical phases that we don't do here, okay? So, and then everything actually is bound from the drill to the analysis, etc., through this uh, uh, system, so okay, uh, we want to use uh, the data in a smart way, okay, and so and it goes up to economic evaluation, that is uh, what they are working, for example, at the Technical University of Death. I will not talk about that, I had a slide on it, but I don't understand it, so I will not uh, <laughs> present it. So, uh, Nickel, actually, Nickel is quite important. Uh, well, it's uh, mainly using stainless steel. You know, really stainless steel without the nickel is not stainless steel, okay? Nickel, chrom, chromium is inside. But uh, maybe less known is uh, one of the principal component. They are super alloy, so the one used in gas turbine, etc. So they are or nickel base or cobalt base, okay? Uh, so actually is uh, nickel also. So all non-ferrous alloy, then plating, other. Well, actually, 60% of nickel is used in uh, stainless steel, and actually 70% is recycled. But uh, still, so there is one part, uh, and we need to extract uh, more nickel, okay? That is decreasing in grade. Now, uh, so, so you see where it's coming from. So there is no practically, well, we can consider Europe here in other, okay? So all the rest is uh, so uh, coming from, so you see Indonesia, Philippines, so uh, New Caledonia, Australia, that part uh, is actually where most of the nickel is, okay? Australia. Uh, end user, well, if you, now, not only nickel is important, actually, uh, because what we have inside is all the, so cobalt, for example. Cobalt uh, at the moment is not, but is becoming actually a strategic uh, metal due to the batteries, okay? So it's, a, it's not the principal element in batteries, but it's a strategic element in batteries. So now, for example, seems like, uh, for example, just reading, Volkswagen, now after the diesel scandal, wanted to, okay, start production of the battery, uh, ensure they could produce sufficient battery in the next uh, years. So they wanted to secure a <coughs> cobalt uh, production. So getting cobalt uh, at a fixed price now, okay? So they couldn't. 
So all the mining, all the, they don't want to <laughs> fix the price on cobalt because they expect the cobalt will actually rise quite a lot in the next uh, few years. Okay? And there is no substitution for it. So actually, so you see, typically, while you see some part of the core are hard, okay, and these actually are the part in which you don't find any more the nickel, okay. The more interesting one are the one uh, in which you have also clays, okay. That is actually one of the problem also <laughs> for oil and gas. So we have to characterize uh, mainly the part uh, with the clays, okay, and. Uh, what you get, uh, starting from the soil, going down, for example, here, limonite, uh, saprolite, okay? So here you, you have, uh, in the saprolite, you have uh, the maximum amount of uh, nickel. And it's actually the green part, uh, you, well, if you have seen serpentine, right? It's green, and the green is due to the nickel part. And normally it's on the, on the boundary, etc. Okay, so here you, Yet. And you see, so the nickel goes up. Well, actually, is a nickel, you talk about, uh, you see, 2%, okay? 1, 2%. Now, we are using extracting from mineral with 1, 2% of nickel. There is no more nickel more than that, okay? So, but there are also other elements. So they are interested now also magnesium, okay? Uh, and there is the cobalt, you see here, while well, iron is uh, always present, okay? So this is actually, we need to go down in deep, see where it increases sufficiently to be extracted, okay? And uh, where we have to end up, uh, okay? Because uh, after uh, is no more uh, useful, okay? Uh, so, and it's actually important to uh, in the end also the general mapping, one of the use of, uh, okay, uh, storing all the information in the cloud uh, and mapping different area, different region, etc., is because in the end you want to also get a better estimate of reserve uh, resources, okay, that is important also for the price, etc. So now, uh, in Europe, uh, there is mainly the processing, okay? So just a uh, distribution, so you see chemicals, smelting, so uh, refinement, okay? Min mining, there are only, well, actually, Finland or uh, Norway, well, Sweden, here it is, uh, okay? And a little bit in Spain and Greece, okay? Most of it, uh, for example, for Eramet, uh, is actually Eramet SLN is in New Caledonia, for example. This is uh, where, uh, and then you know why, okay, you want to analyze on site in New Caledonia, you don't want to, uh, to get it back. So actually what also the expert system must do is substitute uh, a geolo geologist on site, okay? So the geologist can stay in France, okay? and uh, get only the system there. So uh, nickel sulfide, but uh, we are targeting nickel laterite, okay, for this one. Now, uh, there are uh, different uh, instruments to analyze, okay. These are very similar, well, mostly the same uh, system used also for uh, oil and gas, okay. Uh, now, uh, you can have, uh, for example, if you just analyze on site chemistry, then you can use portable XRF, uh, the XRF gun, okay, to a qualitative analysis, just to get there is nickel or not. Uh, or, uh, there are actually, uh, they started to develop a scanner, okay, to scan uh, mainly imaging system or hyperspectra or different. So this is actually done by using just one technique, okay? Or the mineralogy normally is done by uh, taking cut powder, okay? And uh, in the lab, so from the cut uh, you do whatever, from uh, microscopy to uh, infrared, uh, hyperspectral camera, so 
X-ray diffraction, Raman, okay, different photonic system, etc. Now there are also uh, a lot of projects, uh, especially in Australia, by uh, uh, that uh, want to get uh, multiple techniques uh, together to get a better characterization. So Solsa is not the only one. Okay. So now, for example, just to mention, and also, for example, in geolog, you just use, uh, for example, both, uh, well, you use a lot of different techniques, okay? And you also see the same problem, you want to integrate them more and more, okay? Because uh, this is actually important when you have to uh, deal with complex mineralogical samples, okay? So, for example, a couple, well, uh, you can uh, just uh, put uh, down the hole, uh, your system, okay? Well, actually, I am also in another, but this is a network of infrastructure project, PIMAS, in which uh, there are, for example, some people from Barcelona, they just do that, okay? So sending down some sensor, okay? Actually, there's a big concern because you send down the sem the, your sensor, your instrument, uh, and you don't know if you can recuperate it after. So, <laughs> so that is a bit of a technique. Uh, uh, so you send down, even if it is not too much costing, but 30,000, 40,000 sensor going down and then <laughs> stuck, uh, and that's it, okay? So, and the space, it depends on how large uh, is the core. Uh, so, or uh, other are uh, like the Labat rig, this is developed by the Deep Exploration Technology, for example, but they work more on uh, XRF uh, cutting while combining XRD and XRF. Normally they combine just the result, okay? So what we want to do, I will show, is not uh, just combining, we want to use uh, in a uh, smarter way our data. So, in um, Solsa, okay, so we have the drilling, okay, and then uh, the core goes uh, here, there is a conveyor, okay, to move uh, the core, okay, move the core, and actually what you do, you start, because this one uh, can go faster, so we can reach the 60 meter per day, okay, with this one, so you go with the RGB camera, okay, uh, profilometer to get the roughness, etc. but it's also useful then for the XRF. These are all uh, together, okay? The XRF uh, take, uh, is actually, this is for a qualitative XRF, uh, take uh, the area, just to say is uh, nickel there or not, okay? Because when the XRF uh, see no nickel, okay, that part is when we are uh, but this is qualitative, okay? So we cannot uh, get the 0.1% or even, so uh, we just uh, use it as a, a yes or not, okay, to proceed. So, and to get uh, the area. So, and then the hyperspectral camera. So from this one, you get a mapping and you get uh, which are the region of interest, okay? So then, uh, well, actually, uh, this was a big discussion because we but in the end, uh, then uh, on the region of interest, uh, actually, so this is then reduced in powder, pelletized, and then we go with more traditional, but also on-site automatic uh, system. Well, here is uh, one uh, first prototype, but this is for lab, uh, is not actually. Uh, the final one uh, actually is a little bit uh, similar to the Equinox you have, uh, but uh, then has another part in it uh, also for the XRF, uh, okay, uh, and uh, the Raman, okay, because we actually what we do in this part here, we do XRD XRF plus Raman, and the goal of that part uh, is in the end on the region of interest to get uh, phases and chemical content, okay. That is where we work uh, more uh, in Trento, okay. We are not involved with the first part, well, the XRF mainly, but uh, the rest. Okay, so just going, uh, the drilling, okay, the drilling is also, we, you want to do a drilling connected to everything because you, you want to get uh, feedback uh, 
from all the rest uh, and uh, continuous and on time. So uh, while well, part was decided to go with the Sony drilling because Sony drilling is actually they can go sufficiently faster, okay, without destroying the the log. Okay, so uh, so they are working standard, etc. Uh, so recover as much as possible the core, okay. Sometimes the core is also full of water, so you have also then to dry, okay, for the analysis. For example, the hyperspectra don't work, uh, infrared don't work if there is water, okay. So you have to remove uh, the water. Um, so uh, we call it uh, uh, then uh, ID2A, the one uh, doing the core scanner. So it need to be connected with that one and also to do the real-time decision. Actually, uh, for example, uh, use uh, on the cloud, etc. why you want everything connected. Because uh, when you have um, using machine learning technique, etc., at a certain point, from the, from the imaging, okay? From the imaging at the moment, it's not so easy to get exactly. I know they claim uh, you can get uh, even, okay, here there is Fosterite or uh, Lizardite, but it's not so. Sometimes they don't distinguish where the core is from the background, okay? So that is, uh, but uh, this is improving. And as you store uh, more data, uh, you can, uh, compare with different uh, similar area and you know when you have to expect uh, when for example the nickel go down to a certain level etc so from the morphology etc texture etc okay so this is why the system so we we'll start uh, Eramet especially wanted also for example in Vilnius a special database for them in which they can store all the mining operation around to just uh, gain uh, data on this one. So, but first, uh, okay, the first year uh, was built uh, this ID1, okay, this was a lab instrument in which we simply combine the XRD, XRF, uh, infrared, uh, and Raman together, just to see what kind of problem we get, uh, is it possible? So actually, is, uh, you see is the instrument inside here, it's very difficult to reach uh, the place where to put the sample <laughs> because it's, uh, yeah, in fact, here without the cabin, and actually here there is not the uh, infrared is out uh, and the Raman also, okay? So you have a little bit more space to see, okay? Um, now is uh, operative, and actually it was uh, decided after that, for example, the infrared, uh, we move out, uh, okay? Because actually it doesn't, give us uh, what we needed is mainly use it inside the hyperspectra, okay? And then also now we use a different strategy for XRD, XRF, uh, and Raman. The XRF also was changed, okay? So at the beginning here in this instrument, you get only one source, okay? And with that source, uh, you just uh, do the XRF and XRD. That is, well, the problem is, for XRD you need a monochromized, monochromatized radiation, okay? If you monochromatize the molybdenum, okay, you don't excite uh, then uh, light element for the XRF. So, at the beginning, we thought it was not a problem because nickel, uh, manganese uh, was the target, okay. Now they want to see the magnesium. So magnesium, this instrument cannot see the magnesium. So in SOSA, in the ID2B, we have to modify that one because we have to work uh, in vacuum, etc., and uh, get, uh, and also we don't work with the uh, monochromatized radiation because we need to excite uh, the magnesium. That is, okay, technical detail, but uh, okay, it was a good experience. Before we had only one instrument, we built the first one in Trento, okay, that is, we build that, but it was only XRD, XRF, okay? And also we didn't target magnesium, okay? Now this is just uh, uh, designed instead of ID2A, okay? So the 
conveyor part, so where there is the log, the core, uh, the, dr the core, the drill core, okay, and the different component. Actually, they started to build. This one is actually also now uh, the XRF is in. Uh, okay, this is actually uh, six months ago picture. So they just uh, have more uh, inside. So and you see then uh, with the lamp uh, for the uh, for uh, the hyperspectral near uh, sphere, etc. Okay. So and this actually this in this moment is in uh, at Inel in France. So they are testing it. So we we have still uh, uh, one year and a half before. Well, one year and something before it, it is supposed to go to New Caledonia, okay? Uh, yeah, so it goes, uh, so four minutes per meter, okay? That is, uh, so at the moment the call uh, is, is going. So that one, okay, will not see the magnesium, okay? We work for the XRF, we work in air, so it's only to see the nickel, manganese, etc. Magnesium is a different beast, so it's not, uh, okay? And so after, well, ID1 uh, will remain uh, in cone, where it is actually. Instead, ID2 A and B will go to New Caledonia, okay? Well, it need to be completed, adapted, uh, so it's actually, and uh, make sure it uh, can work uh, in a, uh, well, uh, an ambient like the mine that is actually maybe even a little bit uh, worse than uh, on a on a platform right okay so let's go to the other part so this is about uh, drilling and uh, measuring okay getting the data uh, now so the core scanner and data okay so what we do we need to analyze all the data so we do on a workstation and we are col connected with online database actually the connection is only to store uh, data at the end so the result uh, or to get uh, some update uh, but not continuous we suppose that uh, there is no continuous connection because it's not so easy to provide continuous connection to something okay but then uh, we need also Feedback, so the sonic drilling data, so we store also, okay, uh, how hard uh, is going down with the drilling, et cetera, what is encountering, okay, goes also to the database, and then we get a geolocation, feedback, et cetera, statistical var variation. There are also other parts. So in the online database, we have also crystallographic, spectroscopy, geological data that we need for the analysis, okay? And we see this also is another part of the project. We are uh, building the database also, okay? So let's see, this is the part uh, we develop uh, particularly in Trento. So it's for the analysis. One part of the analysis, when you want to do the, uh, let's say now the mineralogical and chemical analysis, that is the last one you need at the end, okay? So it's actually the data, the result you need to, to decide, okay, this is good for extraction or not, okay? So now you want to do that part also automatic, okay? Completely, so, and this is not uh, so easy, okay? Get, uh, analyze a mineralogical sample from the diffraction, and uh, fluorescent point of view to get quantitative analysis in an automatic way. So we are developing our algorithm, okay, to do it. We have input from uh, the XRF, uh, uh, all our database, okay, containing the different phases, okay. Uh, Raman, well, actually the drift uh, we, we, we will not use in the end. And so in the end, uh, what we want is uh, better phase quantification, chemical quantification, okay? So that is uh, our goal, okay? Well, that uh, actually this one loop uh, need to work uh, on a workstation, so 
and is a little bit. Uh, now, for example, okay, we have seen different techniques. Now, one part is the Raman. Okay, the problem of the Raman. Raman is very good uh, to well. People are excited about using the Raman for uh, mineralogical analysis. Okay, the next uh, so in nineteen. Uh, uh, they are putting the Raman in one of the uh, space mission, another one in Mars, okay, in which they want to do mineralogical analysis. There is one problem with the Raman. So the Raman, okay, you is very good if you go with the micro Raman, pick up one grain by one grain, because one grain, then okay, you are not able to identify everything, but uh, maybe okay, you get an idea. They could be this one or this one. Sometimes you get uh, simply something is not in because maybe there is only one grain of the, that phase and you pick up just that, okay? Quantification is not possible with the Raman, okay? And sometimes the artery can distinguish between, because Raman is based on vibration, okay? So all the carbonate vibrate the same way, okay? So it's quite difficult then to this. When you have a complex, system which you have 10 phases okay and uh, a lot of uh, clay for them all the clay they see carbon <laughs> this carbon okay these are uh, uh, or the carbonate or uh, so is a bit uh, but sometimes for certain phases okay is uh, for example this light okay you can distinguish the other problem at the moment there is no computation really you have to uh, face with the uh, experimental data. At the moment, the best database is the roof, okay? All uh, Rama people are using the roof in which uh, there are stored different phases. We found also some are wrong. In fact, uh, they identify, for example, in such a case, one phase, uh, but we saw by diffraction it was not that one, it was another, and they, they discovered in the roof uh, there was the wrong uh, classification. We are also in the source uh, building up another database just focused on uh, the phases we need. What we will use the Raman in the end uh, is just uh, the identification by diffraction is the most difficult part. Sometimes when you identify all the mineralogical phases in, then you can quantify easily. But the first identification sometimes is uh, not easy when you have a lot of phases, okay? Because you see everything overlap. Now, the Raman can help uh, to just see single phases, is not uh, affected by texture, orientation, etc. So it will help. So we will use it uh, as input uh, which phases to force in the diffraction to see. Okay? Now, the quantification in the end I explained is done by this X, XRD and XRF. What we do in Trento, what we started is combining it, not from the point of view of result, okay? But uh, we combine, so we do a unique analysis, so you can collect the two data, same machine, different machine. We geolog, uh, actually, we target different machine. And then what you do? For example, here is a cement, okay? In a cement, uh, while well, you have uh, many phases, okay? So, and then when you do the XRF, uh, you just see you just see the element. Actually, maybe you don't see the light element here if you do in air, okay? And now, for example, some people try to get the phases from the XRF. Actually, this is very difficult, okay? But one example, you see potassium, okay? But there is no potassium phase. Actually, the potassium is substituted to the calcium, okay? So. What you get uh, from here is that you fit, uh, you get the amount of uh, the, in this case, uh, calcite, but the calcium is also in the, here in the belite, alite, uh, etc. okay? So in everyone, you substitute the, uh, the potassium, for example, and then you fit at the same time both, uh, okay? So here we use what is called the Ritfel, okay, for the XOD, and here what uh, is called fundamental parameter. But we use uh, one model, okay, to fit both. When we fit uh, both, uh, okay, then we have, uh, we solve the matrix problem for XRF, uh, okay? So 
we get a, a true quantification. We don't need any calibration standard, etc. That is, uh, without calibration, independent of uh, what you have inside. You see the phases here. You see the element there. The diffraction doesn't see the element. Just see the phases, OK? The crystallographic part. XRF doesn't see the crystallographic part. Just see the element, OK? And when you combine, so you need the crystallographic phase with the proper composition that match. Uh, and this is actually what we do. E, we wanted at the beginning, we thought uh, the Ramanin, OK? But we discovered the Raman is not so simple to model, et cetera. So some example, quick example. So this one were collected actually in Trento with our machine. So one source, uh, a two detector, one for XRD and one for uh, XRF, OK? Um, so well, this is a simple one we use at the beginning. So dolomite quartzite. Well, there is also quartz. I put the wrong one here. but uh, And then uh, you get also quantification. And you see there is also strontium substituted inside. So you get uh, the correct composition also for the dolomite, et cetera. Uh, one problem then uh, is when you go to clay. I say clay is a different beast, uh, actually. And uh, the problem is also in diffraction. Clay have uh, this kind of uh, disorder, OK? And uh, what uh, the problem is? Uh, Quantify, so clay content is very difficult with this disorder. And then the other is texture also, because they, they normally align, OK? So we have also the problem of texture. So this is kaolinite. If you see in TEM, they have kaolinite is even more difficult because the disorder is modulated, so-called, OK? Well, now, thanks to one trick developed by some people in Germany, Ufer and other, OK, we can model also clay now, modulator, et cetera. So we can use them uh, in the, our quantification uh, with the rhythm. OK, so and actually, so it works. Uh, so for example, this is a kaolinite uh, a combined analysis in which, uh, so you see, well, this is the content of this kaolinite. Uh, didn't have only, he had uh, titanium, cerium oxide, chromium, et cetera, et cetera. So you see very well there. Now, uh, so what we say in SOLSA normally, uh, in the end, what we need is uh, to get the core. We need uh, just to get uh, where we need to do the analysis. And then in the end, we need that XRD, XRF work well to get the nickel content, OK? So now XRD, XRF, uh, uh, we have some problem. We struggle. In the end, uh, in SOLSA, the prototype, the, the final prototype, the XRD and the XRF are separated, are not uh, together, OK? Not uh, one instrument. So it means uh, two different instruments. In the ID2B, in practice, they are in parallel, but two different sources, uh, two detector, and so and the sample need to move from one to the other, OK? That is like uh, you do in Geolog. So, but now, what you do if, uh, and this is actually the target of this one. You want, uh, we build up in Trent also, we started, uh, you want a portable instrument. You want to go on site, put on, the ro on a rock, okay, and see not only, like you do for XRF, uh, just you point, uh, and then you see, okay, there is iron, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to go there and, and put, there and say, OK, here we have a lizardite, uh, fagialite, or whatever. OK, that is uh, so the geologists uh, want to get. That. And that one may be small enough you can put in your backpack, right? <laughs> or in any case, that you point on the rock uh, easily. Now, first, you don't need, uh, so this one should be compact. OK, work on battery, etc. but uh, also need to be. Uh, fix, everything fix, no movement, OK? So you, you have to solve all the problems, so no movement. And you have to reduce the number of components. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So you cannot take the <coughs> equinox, right, and put the, and also the, flu, the fluorescent gun, et cetera. And you want to point uh, the same point, OK? Because on a rock, uh, due to the heterogeneity, 
okay? Well, in the lab, uh, you can provide or a particular instrument that you point and then by imaging, you point in the same uh, with both X and the XRF. But on the field, uh, this is, you want to do it. Uh, so, well, actually what uh, uh, we say, and remember the problem is also that one source is good for uh, EV element, not light, and the source uh, good for uh, XRF light element is not good for XRD. So typically, yeah, there are fluorescent gun or uh, this one. Actually, this one is uh, the first uh, you were using in Geolog, uh, for example, that one, okay? Uh, both uh, these one were coming from the Kemin. So the Kemin is the one developed for uh, the Mars rover that is uh, now in Mars, okay? Uh, Actually, that was a really inspiring project in which you have a micro focus. So point here, you get uh, this sample order vibrating. It's the same you get inside there. And so you get the diffraction. And in principle, you can do also fluorescence by the same, provided you have a very low beam here. So in Mars is OK, because uh, they have a month. So when they drill one sample, it takes from two days to one week to drill one sample, and then they can measure for uh, one week, uh, etc. So they measure the XRD, collect. Actually, the XRF is not so good, it is uh, much worse, okay, the real one. Uh, well, the problem they discovered in Mars uh, with this one was that uh, because the rover doesn't contain only the chemin, it contains also other biological analysis, uh, environmental, etc. So what they need uh, them is the rover staying there to drill <laughs> for uh, one day at least, okay? But the other instead uh, don't want to, st to stay there. They want to go around uh, to, because uh, the analysis are much quicker and they want to sample all around. So in the end, uh, they analyze only three or four sample because they had to compromise with the other team so to stay there or to go around. If they go around, they cannot, uh, they cannot drill, they cannot get sample. So actually, the, the, the problem is actually in that case is the drilling. So that uh, they came in. Now, OK, the idea for Peridix is, uh, well, the, what is under the project is the development of a new detector. Okay, a new sensor, so we can get rid of uh, having two sensor, two source, etc., and make uh, something very compact. So, well, this is something I we collected in Trento, okay, in which we collect uh, like uh, you collect uh, XRD, but with an XRF detector. So you collect uh, here, you change uh, the angle, so the diffraction angle where you see the peak. And here you change instead the energy. So what you see here are both uh, XRD, uh, so the diffraction and fluorescence, so at once. So well, actually, one of these need in the lab uh, one week to collect, OK? So but because uh, this uh, XRF detector that they have uh, energy resolution, they are, uh, well, or 25 millimeter minimum, OK? So you have to cut them because you want uh, angular resolution. And then you have to scan. Or you can put uh, many of them, but this is not. Uh, so what uh, in Trento we have uh, Foundation Bruno Kessler, actually, they work on XRF uh, silicon. Okay? So silicon uh, uh, sensor for XRF. And in Milano, there is one of the best places for the electronic to analyze the data. So we put together the people there. So they will build a sensor in which we have uh, the energy resolution of a typical SDD detector for, but uh, in stripe, OK? So we get uh, the angular resolution. So then, uh, and this is actually Thermo Fisher who is already thinking, uh, so they can put uh, all these elements, OK? Well, how many depend on the cost, uh, but actually, we realize we don't need a really large one. And so you just scan one, uh, everything fixes. So you put there, 
one detector, one source. Now, here the best is no monochromatized source, okay? So, and actually, so what we see, here is normally what we see in diffraction along here. So these are the diffraction peak, okay? For uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, barium sulfate, okay? Oh, yeah, barium sulfate. Or, uh, well, I had two. Uh, one barium sulfate, another barium titanate, okay? And other sample we scan. Uh, then uh, this uh, continuous line here are the fluorescence line, okay? So this one give you the element inside. This one give you the crystallography, okay? And then this one is just the diffraction part due to the brain stratum. When you don't monochromatize, you get the brain stratum. This water give you the problem, okay? So let's see, this one, for example, is another one. It's just silicon, so much uh, more simple. So, so uh, using collected with this SDD detector with 100 microns lit in front of it. So what we see here, for example, silicon line, argon line, iron line here, okay? These are fluorescence, okay? Then we get uh, diffraction. The diffraction you see is uh, not continuous. Now this part here is the diffraction due to the brain stratum. The brain stratum is not a fixed wavelength. Is, uh, so you get the diffraction changing. And uh, so a different angle is like the Bragg law you invert, you see in lambda instead of uh, in theta, okay? So, but uh, what is good is that uh, here, so you, can, you have a high energy. Normally, if you use molybdenum here, you, it's not good uh, for, to analyze clay, for example, because all the clay peak, uh, the best peak for clay are at a very low angle. You don't see with molybdenum. They are just <laughs> down here, okay? But uh, they come up uh, with, the short, the, with the longest wavelength here. So you see in the brain stratum. Now also you can separate uh, well, Comstone, okay? Because uh, what are the XRD problem? You normally, okay, your detector just uh, integrate over here. So you get also the Compton in it, uh, everything. And if there, are, and also, well, normally it's really integrated over here if you don't have a monochromator in the diffracted beam. Okay, so all this part, where they go? In the background, so you have a high background, okay, and uh, all this stuff in it. So just to see the peak uh, that are the bump over here, okay? Uh, when you do XRF, uh, if it is not monochromatized, so um, all this part here, they go inside also. And what you get, uh, because uh, in XRF, uh, then you integrate uh, down here, okay? So you get everything because uh, these uh, detectors uh, are very close. They collect uh, every in a large angle, okay? So you get a high background. So typically, okay, in XRF, uh, you get this uh, bump over here, okay? While in log, you see. And this is what you don't want, why you monochromatize. But if you monochromatize, okay, you get read there, you don't see the light element, okay? So in energy. And in diffraction, okay, the other problem. So instead, uh, what we will do with our Peridix is just one instrument, we collect both, and we process, we separate completely the two effects. And we can use one source, we don't monochromatize nothing, we don't lose any photon, we just use every photon inside, okay? So to speed up the, analysis, the collection time, make everything more compact, etc. So I think this one is right. And so then we just process our fundamental read well, we combine really together in a map, and we fit. okay? So the Peridix goal, well, Peridix just started is uh, January, so we are just at the beginning. They are already uh, starting to produce the the first sensor, okay? So we are, uh, we wanted to put the first sensor in an instrument, okay, by the end of the year, because actually it's a very quick project. It's an upscaling project, okay? So, and everything, the rest we have already. So it's only the sensor, okay? And uh, so we 
point to get uh, something very small, portable, okay? So that can be used for exploration or mining, okay? Uh, like use a portable XRF with a uh, small cost. Now, the component can be also reused. What is, so when you develop the sensor, then you can put that sensor also in a lab instrument, okay? Different cost to get also better analysis in the lab, okay? And uh, there is also another, we, we are uh, building up a project, we tried already project because this uh, will really useful for uh, one of the future mission, okay? Well, it seems, seems like mining in the future is going into the space, okay? There is already one, uh, uh, it's called, uh, uh, it's not an, well, it is an association or uh, for uh, mining on asteroid, something like that. Yeah, they are, uh, they want to, they start, they start already at least the business, okay? They want to mine, the asteroid are the perfect one because uh, you have a high concentration of certain metal there, okay? But you have to get something there to analyze first, do the exploration, and then you can mine and send back, okay? Okay, that's uh, all. Oh. Okay. <laughs> 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 to, to come very close to the microphone. Oh. Uh, you showed during the, your presentation. You showed uh, one of the uh, one instrument that, that was like a monster uh, because it was combining uh, ah. uh, XRD, XRF, uh, and uh, I, yeah. infrared and so on. Yeah, ID one. ID one. And you said that uh, you were not very interested. Uh, if I was understood, you were not very interested in infrared. Uh, well, it's actually this. Yeah. And Raman and we are not infrared because uh, it was not bringing uh, uh, additional information. Uh, looking at the, at the problem from our side, you know, you know yeah. we are looking at oil and gas. Uh, you know, coming back, you, you, yeah, your presentation was very interesting, but uh, you know, was mainly focused on on mining. Uh, but uh, we are SP, SP is petroleum engineering, so it means that uh, we are interested in oil and gas. And uh, my point is, uh, if this one uh, could be used also on, on our samples, because I think that uh, to combine the mineralogical, the, say, mineralogical characterization with the organic matter, and infrared can help right. a lot in, in characterization of the organic matter or of the oil, I think that we can combine the two and understand how it is, uh, how the, yeah. the mineral matrix and the organic, uh, mat and the organic. Uh, right. say, yeah, is this is a very good question. I forgot to mention, initially the, the main goal of the infrared was to determine the organic part because also it matters for, for them because if they have organic inside, okay, the process, the smelting, etc., cetera, the refining, refining process change because it's not uh, actually the same. The only problem is, uh, is uh, that with this kind of sample, with a little bit of water that is already, we get, uh, we cannot analyze, uh, but on dry sample, okay, it, uh, it can work uh, actually in ID1. Now, in, uh, in the other one, simply we move out uh, from the final characterization, we move in the pre, where you just have to identify the region of interest. But this one, okay, yeah, is, uh, and it is available, it's a lab instrument, okay, that, uh, can, if you are interested, just to try, yeah, is not, 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 not us, I think that could be No, no, it could be. I think it also could be interesting. Uh, so for, for the moment, we discharge the infrared because we had to point yeah, uh, more. Uh, we decided more on the high perspective that was not in, but uh, maybe in the future we will. <laughs> I think that there is a market, at least that there is a market in USA for unconventional. You know, unconventional, they are looking at the properties right. of the rock and the properties of the organic matter inside the rock. Yeah, yeah. So no, no. I think that something like that could be very interesting. In that yeah, in, in so day. let's say mainly this chart. We, it, it went to second uh, order problem. So we, at the moment, we 
we decided not to use it. Okay. If I can now ask another question. <laughs> Sorry, I was not to ask too many questions. But you mentioned the problem of uh, clay minerals, uh, and uh, my question is uh, with the new approach, uh, combining, uh, combining, you know, for the oil and gas, uh, clay mineral presence and characterization uh, is very important. It's important for drilling, but it's important as well also for, uh, uh, say, for a convention or for mineralogical characterization, for fascist characterization. So our geologists are very crazy for, mineral, for clay uh, mineral characterization. If I well understood the new approach that we are following to combine with the one sensor, combining uh, XRD and XRF, yeah. it could help a lot. Yeah. So my, my, my question is, uh, what is the, the perspective for the future? You know, we can, we can hope that in the future we'll be able uh, to characterize better and faster the clay mineral clay mineral. At, uh, yeah. at, uh, at well site, because I think that this can make uh, happy the, uh, the, the drillers, because uh, expandable, yeah. expandable uh, clays are a real uh, problem, and at the same time can be used for characterization, for, say, formation characterization, and for, so this is, uh, can bring a lot of can bring a lot of pieces of information for for oil and gas that yeah. is uh, important. Yeah, yeah. For clay mineral, there is from one side is the modeling, okay, and on that one, well, we have other problem also that we are uh, so for uh, from the point of it, but these are technical problem, okay, that uh, we can is only making it a, a little bit harder, but we can so we can uh, go through. The other is, uh, yeah, the measurement, because with clay, it's important to get the low angle line, and uh, actually, so you need, uh, uh, so this one can help a lot, uh, and especially also in clay, you have always iron, for example, or other metal, you have high fluorescence, so everything is more complicated, but uh, let's say the sensor of paradox, uh, Let's hope uh, it work as they promise. <laughs> well, in principle, they said it's, it's simple. It's like a, a, an SDD sen uh, sensor used for XRF, only instead of getting just, uh, in reality, there is one, like that one, is uh, big, what they said normally. There is also another one in, um, in uh, München. Uh, they develop uh, one is a is called the color camera, in which uh, they they have the SDD per pixel, but this actually is a 25 by 25 micron pixel, and you have only 256 by 256. It's very small. You get a lot of uh, data there, but uh, it's small, so you collect a photon, and the cost is uh, well. In the past, it was uh, this uh, small one few millimeter by few millimeter was about uh, one million, okay? So only a couple of synchrotron uh, <laughs> facility have to keep. Now we got an offer. In fact, before we get, got approved this one, we were thinking to buy one because we got an offer because we could develop the software for 200,000. That is already, well, the detector is so small, but then you have a cabinet like this for the electronic. Okay, so in Peridic we say, no, we don't need uh, such a small pick. We just lean some strip, 100 micron, okay? So let's go in between and so that, uh, <laughs> let's see what happens. Okay. Facciamo la fine, concludiamo. Beh, l'ultima No, I, I, I just want to be very, very brief uh, in concluding this, uh, this uh, uh, presentation because we have a number of other things to do tonight before going home <laughs> tonight. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Professor Luca Luterotti. Uh, what I really appreciated was, uh, the, let's say, the technical density of the presentation. If I have to be very clear, I'm really fed up 
of a very, very simple presentations that you can understand anything just because they are not for technical people, they are just for selling uh, some apparatus to, to some uh, procurement uh, manager. Uh, in this case, we are doing what SPE should be doing. I mean, discuss uh, real technical knowledge. And of course, I could not uh, understand everything it's, it, because my background is different, but I really appreciate that it was a presentation about which I could not understand everything, and this is uh, <laughs> quite, quite good. The second thing is that uh, uh, is, the, is the topic of cross-fertilization, how we call it. Um, and, and actually, Mario made a comment, Mario Chiaramonte made a comment before in this question. Uh, yes, at, at the beginning you see the similarities, no? And it, it's, it's impressive how many similarities between mining and oil industry there are. Later you start deepening a little bit and you start looking at the large differences that are there. And so actually to apply close fertilization, you really need strong involvement, deep understanding, because cross fertilization in the simple way almost never works. Okay. So, so this is an, another important point that we need to address, and SPE is, is the right place to, to do this discussion. And the third thing I was impressed about is the, is the role of geologue. Actually, it's, it's extremely important that uh, a company like Geolog is, is uh, involving itself in these processes, processes of, of innovation because they are hard, but uh, is where possibly a real value can come out. So uh, when, uh, when um, uh, Antonio Caleri was saying, okay, we are Italian company, we are very technically good, is something I really believe in. And we are not simply reducing costs because we, we take people who, which cost less because they are for some foreign, foreigner country. We compete uh, because of the extremely high technical knowledge that we can put inside. So the value comes from a deeper understanding. So this really requires a, a great applause to companies like Geolog who are doing this for all of us. So thank you very much for this uh, beautiful event. And I hope that we are going to see another three extremely interesting presentation very nearby. Thank you very much. <laughs>